So since the capacity for adaptive evolution is central to uh, almost any definition of life, uh, uh, an important question for us to understand is what is the simplest system capable of undergoing adaptive evolution? Um, now we need this because we need to have an adaptive process to explain how life could come to be as complicated as it is today. Uh, even the simplest cell um, has within it an incredibly intricate metabolic system and genetic system that allows it to function and um, survive, reproduce, uh, and propagate. Um, now this complexity has long posed problems for the origin of life field. Uh, and in fact, famously, uh, the astronomer Fred Hoyle uh, you know, raised the, 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 the crazy idea. He says, the probability of life emerging spontaneously from primordial soup is about as likely as a tornado going through a junkyard and spitting out a fully formed uh, jumbo jet. And so, um, well, it's a bit hyperbolic. It is undoubtedly the case that a modern cell is far too complicated to evolve without some kind of prior adaptive process. And so we need to start thinking about what does a, how does adaptation work and how could it begin working on something simpler than a modern cell. So let's just start by a quick refresher on how basic Darwinian evolution works. So the idea of Darwinian evolution uh, or natural selection is that you have uh, cells or organisms that, that propagate themselves, that replicate, divide. So here we have one uh, bacterial cell giving rise to two daughter cells. And of course it passes to those daughter cells its genetic machinery. And um, the, genetic mach the DNA that it, in that it gives to its daughter cells control the features of, those, of the daughter cells. Now while those two daughter cells are going to be very, very similar, one of them could experience a mutation in its DNA that would result in that individual being able to function differently to use resources differently in some way. And that could give that organism's descendants an advantage such that over time they come to outcompete and predominate with res relative to the uh, organisms in the population that don't have that muta mutation. And finally, that could take over the whole population. Now what's important about this is whether or not the blue variant or the black variant were to win in the long run is it is entirely driven by the effect of the mutation on the thinness of the organisms. And it's ir irrelevant whether it makes the organism more or less complicated. And as a result of that, adaptive evolution is a process that can yield over many, many rounds dramatic increases in complexity over time. So uh, it's clearly essential that we understand Darwinian evolution as a way to build the first cell. So the, um, what we can then infer is that to get to the very first cell, we need some process of natural selection that could allow it to complexify. The problem that this poses is what does it require? What is required for natural selection? Well, as you just saw, natural selection requires replication. And the only kind of replication we know about today is that uh, that cells use, which is a very complicated process involving you know, DNA replication and lots of, lots of complicated processes, posing us in a classic chicken and egg problem. We need replication in order to get our natural selection to occur. Uh, we need natural selection to generate com the complexity we see in modern cells. And we seem to need that level of complexity in order to achieve replication. So the scientists have figured out a few ways out of this sort of bottleneck, this conundrum, uh, and I wanted to share a couple of the alternatives. So one approach is to say, we actually began not with a, a cell with a genetic system, but a cell that had some kind of non-genetic heredity. So uh, a cell is encloses a metabolism, and that metabolism is a dynamical system. So when a cell grows and divides, both daughter cells will tend to m inherit that uh, common dynamical state. In much the same way that a candle flame is a dynamical state that can be used to pass on to another candle wick, uh, even though there is no genetic machinery there. So the first idea is that you can have an evolving cellular system that doesn't have genetics, and genetics evolves later. And there are theoretical models that show that it's at least theoretically possible for cells with this kind of analog inheritance to, um, to evolve adaptively. The second possibility is that 
we actually began with genes before we had cells. And so another strand of thinking in the origin of life field has been that the first evolving entity was a single mm, clever s molecule that could replicate itself, an RNA molecule that so could somehow make more copies of itself, at which point it would begin ev uh, evolving by natural selection, even if it was not in a cell. And then the idea goes that maybe somehow it would marshal uh, other tools to help it survive and replicate better, and that might involve building a cell at some point. So that's the second possibility. Um, but that many people, and I'm going to say myself included, would still c are concerned that both of those two starting points are not simple enough. So the simplest protocell capable of dividing and enclosing this dynamical system would still have to be pretty complicated. It would have to arise spontaneously without any prior adaptive process. It would need to be able to grow, regulate the transport of metabolites into the cell and out of the cell. It would have to be able to divide in some kind of orderly manner. And that seems very unlikely to arise spontaneously. Similarly, uh, a lot of work has shown that a single RNA molecule of sufficient complexity to replicate itself is very, very improbable to arise spontaneously, especially considering that the building blocks of RNA, um, the nucleotides themselves, are not likely just to be sitting around in the environment in high abundance. So some of us have begun to think that we might need to be looking even simpler than these two starting points. And simpler still is to actually begin imagine that we have non-genetic systems that are not in cells. They don't have, but they can, and they can, they can, um, they have the potential to evolve adaptively, even if they're not in cells, if they have some kind of spatial structure. So for example, it's known from mathematical work that you can actually see adaptive evolution in spatially structured populations, even if that spatially structured population is not organized in distinct groups. So this raises the possibility then that the first adaptively evolving system were flat living systems, slimes-like things that lived on surfaces, uh, had a metabolism maintaining a dynamical state that could grow and evolve adaptively, and then later give rise to cells. And in fact, there is a lateral expectation that systems might um, complexify in this way because um, a cell can be seen as, as being a very good way for a surface-associated system to get to another surface to colonize. So as we've seen, spatial structure doesn't require that one have, um, uh, allows for adaptive evolution without bounded cells. And so one can imagine a situation in which in an ancient ocean there were mineral surfaces that became coated by these life-like systems that could uh, spread over the surfaces grow and generate variants that might be subject to some of the kinds of selection we talked about before. Um, and it's also been argued that these could naturally give rise to cells because cells provide a way, or could have initially provided a way, for one surface-associated metabolism to get into the ocean and then back onto another surface. And that this provides a relatively simple adaptive path from a flat life <laughs> to cellular life and allows that the, the first emerging systems were these surface systems which for various theoretical reasons seem much easier to imagine arising spontaneously than an enclosed cell. So uh, sort of to sort of summarize where we stand right now, um, evolutionary theory is uh, a, a constantly changing field and our models have become more and more sophisticated and we now appreciate that a, a view of evolution that requires cells and genetic encoding is perhaps too stringent. And it's becoming clear that uh, advances in the original life field may come from accepting the possibility that very simple systems, much simpler than we're used to thinking about, could be the first adaptively evolving progenitors of life as we know it.